Hello, everyone. Welcome to Victory of the Lamb. Thank you for joining us here in person and online via live stream for our Maundy Thursday worship. If you're here in the Ministry Center, we encourage you to stand and join us as we sing our first song.
Thank you, Victor Life. Good evening. You may be seated. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the most important week of the year, Holy Week, where we remember Jesus who started at Palm Sunday, uh, marching into Jerusalem, and now tonight where he gathered with his disciples and he told them about the work that he's about to do. And then tomorrow when we celebrate how he went to the cross for our sins, and then on Easter we celebrate his glorious resurrection. It's our privilege to have uh, Pastor Terry Schultz here, missionary Terry Schultz. He's actually a, a member of our congregation, but you probably don't see him much because he's always traveling uh, really all over the world. What he does for our church body is he um, helps people groups uh, take the message of the gospel and put it to the music that is appropriate for um, for their culture. And so we give him a hard time because he's never around. He's all, he's in Vietnam or he's in Africa, he's in other places. And I've been following him for a long time, actually. He did a lot of missionary work and to reach unreached people in the middle of the jungle. And so if you want an interesting conversation, take him out for lunch sometime. Well, we want to get an opportunity for you to connect here. Um, you can use that QR code in the seat back in front of you to check in. That's a way for us to know that you're here and to pray for you uh, throughout the week. Uh, also, if you have any prayer requests, uh, you can fill out a prayer request card as well. Um, we really want to give an opportunity to, for all of us to remember why we're here. You know, many of us, maybe we grew up inside the Christian church, and so Monday, Thursday is something we've done year after year. It's a tradition that we've always held. For some of us, maybe we grew up that way, but for whatever reason, we walked away. Maybe we had a bad experience. Uh, maybe we struggled and now we're checking it out again, and we're so thankful that you're here. And for some of you, this is your first time, maybe at Victory, a first time at a Christian worship service, and we just want to let you know that no matter who you are, no matter what brought you here, welcome home. Welcome to Victory. I want to give an opportunity to welcome one another and encourage you to, if you're able, to stand and greet the people around you. So tonight is celebrating Monday Thursday. It's not Monday Thursday, but Monday Thursday. It comes from a Latin word that means a command. And it's tonight where we remember how Jesus made two commands. He told his disciples as he was gathering with them to celebrate the Passover, he commanded them to love one another. That was his command as he washed their feet this evening. We remember that. And then also he gave us the command to take and eat, take and drink. Tonight is the night that he instituted the Lord's Supper, which we're, of course, going to celebrate and receive this evening. So think about that. Uh, think about Jesus gathering with his disciples as we worship him uh, this evening. Now we're going to continue with our forgive us, renew us, lead us. Response we encourage you to join in. As the disciples gathered with Jesus in the upper room on that first Monday, Thursday evening, let us welcome Jesus into our hearts and homes as well. In the presence of God, we confess our sins to him and ask for his forgiveness. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Jesus said, A new command I give you, Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. However, we must confess that because of our own selfishness, our own stubbornness, and our own slowness to forgive, we have not always lived or loved as the disciples Jesus called us to be. Sin has dimmed the brightness of our witness as the church the world. Therefore, as we approach God today, we do so taking ownership of our sins while at the same time trusting the perfect sacrifice of Jesus so that we could be forgiven. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you and humbly confess my sinfulness. I have sinned knowingly and unknowingly by things I've said and things I've done, by things I've left unsaid and things I've left undone. Today I confess that my sins have ruined my relationship with you and with others. Calm my troubled and often worried heart with your forgiveness. Show me what your Son has done for me and for the whole world. 
teach me what it looks like to love as Jesus has loved me, then help me to live as a member of your church by the power of your spirit. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I have good news. God, our Heavenly Father, has seen all of our sins. He's seen all the ways that we've strayed, all the things that we struggle with, and that's why this week happened. Jesus, the historical person, walked into this world and he lived a perfect life in our place. For all the things that we've done wrong, Jesus did it right as our substitute. And then he went to the cross, carrying every one of your mistakes, every one of your sins, all the things that you're embarrassed about. He took them to the cross and he nailed them to the cross and he died for your sin. And he went to the tomb and He came out of that tomb and he left your sins in the tomb. And so now I can declare with complete confidence that you are a forgiven, loved child of God. Amen. Let's continue by worshiping him. We lift our voices. 
Good evening. I so appreciate an opportunity to bring you a message on this very special night uh, based on some exciting words uh, from, from God's words. If I were to ask you what is the most famous painting in the world, I suspect just about everyone here would say the Mona Lisa. And what many people consider the second most uh, famous painting in the world done by the same person, Leonardo da Vinci, would be his incredible picture uh, mural, The Last Supper. It was painted in a dining room in uh, Santa Maria del Grazi Monastery in Milan, Italy. Uh, the painting was not meant to be historically accurate, uh, but instead to reflect the sensibilities of Leonardo's Renaissance time. Okay, we see Western European faces, uh, classical Greek clothing, marble walls. On top of that, the bread's, the bread's got yeast. The plates and glasses are rather fancy, not the, the clay and wood that would have been there. Uh, there's chairs and everyone's seated on one side of the table. But what made Leonardo's uh, painting so groundbreaking for its time was this. In Leonardo's painting of the Last Supper, um, before his, Last Supper paintings invariably showed um, a very somber mood. Okay, they, they portrayed the moment very somberly of when Jesus broke bread. Leonardo chose what he considered a much more dramatic moment that evening, Jesus telling his closest disciples that one of them would betray him. In Leonardo's painting, we see the disciples stunned, their chaotic response to that news. So much for art history. I would pose the question, was there not a stunned reaction from the disciples upon hearing Jesus speak those astonishing words, take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And later, Jesus taking the cup and saying, drink from it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. No one had ever heard words like that from Jesus or from anyone else ever before. There is nothing in all the world, nothing in all of history that compares to this sacred act which Jesus, which Jesus commanded us to repeat, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, where we receive the Son of God's true body and blood in the bread and wine. So tonight we want to take a closer look at this amazing gift from God and hopefully understand and appreciate even more this wondrous gift from God and what it does for us. For as one writer <laughs> beautifully put it, if angels were capable of envy, and they're not, the one thing they would envy of men is the gift of the Lord's Supper. Let's go back to that Thursday night of Holy Week. Uh, Luke writes in chapter 22, verses 7 to 8, the day of unleavened bread arrived when it was necessary to sacrifice the Passover lamb. Okay, this would have been that perfect, unblemished, one-year lamb as, as, Jesus, or as God commanded in the Old Testament. Verse 8, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. So Jesus and his disciples then gathered that night in the upper room to celebrate the Passover. In the Passover meal, instituted in Old Testament times, we say a foreshadowing of the Lord's Supper just like circumcision foreshadowed baptism. Recall what happened when God commanded that first Passover meal is recorded in Exodus 12. We read, Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and take lambs for yourself according to your family size and slaughter the Passover lamb. You shall take a bundle of hyssop Dip it in the blood that is in the basin and paint the lentil and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you are to go out of the door of your house until morning when the Lord passes through to strike Egypt 
and sees the blood on the lentil and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe these instructions as a perpetual regulation for you and your descendants. Again, the one-year-old unblemished sacrificial lamb's blood smeared on the doorway indicated that those in the household believed in God and his word. Now, to celebrate Passover in Jesus' time in Jerusalem, people brought lambs to be slaughtered to the temple grounds in the afternoon. The lamb's blood was caught in gold and silver vessels and spilled onto the altar. In God's eyes, it was the animal's lifeblood that covered the people's sin, just as blood on the doorframe he had done for in Egypt. It was an extremely graphic and intense reminder of everyone of the deadly seriousness of sin and the need for the shedding of blood for forgiveness. The sacrifice of the lambs pointed, of course, to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. The lamb carcasses were taken back home, roasted over red-hot embers, and care was taken not to break a single bone, again, as God commanded. Now, knowing all this uh, about the Passover helps us understand Monday, Thursday better. So we'll now go to the upper room where Jesus has gathered with his disciples to eat the Passover meal. Something incredible happens immediately. Can we see in Luke again in, uh, in chapter 22? When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the 12 apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Okay, that phrase, will not eat it again. <clears throat> Jesus is straight away abolishing the requirement to celebrate the Passover. 1,400 years of celebrating the Passover, and it will now no longer be required. The reason is obvious. Jesus, of course, knows exactly what is coming. He is about to be the sacrifice. The Lamb of God sacrificed on a cross to take away the sins of the world. What all those thousands and thousands of animal sacrifices over those hundreds of years pointed to, the lambs, the goats, the bulls, the birds, they all pointed to the ultimate sacrifice of the innocent, sinless Son of God. It was now about to happen. Jesus would be sacrificed on the cross once and for all to pay for the world's sin. And so in this very moment, <clears throat> Jesus is about to change that 1,400-year-old uh, Passover meal into something new, something astonishing, an even more exciting feast. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul <clears throat> record the words of institution of the Lord's Supper. You probably could recite these words by memory. They are so precious, so extraordinary. We'll take a look at him right here. Let's read these together. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death <coughs> till he comes. So what are the blessings, the extraordinary blessings that we receive in the Lord's set, uh, Supper? Okay, this we get from those words Jesus uses, given and poured out to you for the forgiveness of sins. 
okay? As, as Galen Schmeling, my dear friend, puts it, the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. By means of grace, we mean an instrument, a channel that brings the benefits of the cross and makes them our own. This sacrament is the gospel. Here we receive all the benefits of Christ's redemptive sacrifice. And so, the primary benefit of the Lord's Supper is that it brings forgiveness of sins. It is a visual version. Think about it. You are visually seeing the saving gospel message right before your eyes. And where there's forgiveness of sins, there is the assurance of eternity in paradise. We may still ask for a moment, the question may still be there understandably, why this particular mysterious act? Why the act of eating and drinking Christ's body and blood in the bread and wine? What is it that God is telling us? <laughs> Consider this. There is nothing that happens in this world that could so closely connect us with something else, with another being, than what occurs in the Lord's Supper. It is a closeness of two beings beyond compare. Literally beyond comprehension. And the two beings that are being connected are you and the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ of the triune God. Martin Luther puts it this way. There is no union more intimate, deep, and inseparable than the union of blood with him who partakes of it, the food with him who partakes of it. Since the food enters his nature, is changed into it, and becomes one with his being. Other unions of two things, <laughs> such as those affected by nails, glue, cords, the like, do not make one individual substance of the objects joined together. Just so we are united with Christ in the sacrament. Secondly, there is the obvious fact that you personally, individually, receive this gift of the sacrament. It's something you see with your own eyes. All of the guilt of your sinful past completely removed. God acts as if those things never happened. This is the forgiveness we receive through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We'll return for a second to Leonardo's Last Supper. There's one more bit of artistic license the artist took that is worth pointing out. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier in Leonardo's painting, it's located in the dining room of a monastery in Italy. There's another special reason why the monks who lived at the time of da Vinci um, completely loved having this painting. Okay, the painting was actually in the dining room of the, of the monastery. The table that Jesus and his disciples are sitting at the table is very much like the original <laughs> dining room tables in the monks' dining, in dining area. The windows that Leonardo painted are actually resemble the real windows of the dining room. So the effect of all this, okay, the tables, the windows, as one art critic writes, Leonardo's approach shifts the long ago supper into the present tense. 
The Last Supper appears to occur every time the monks sit down to dinner. Brothers and sisters, so it is with us. In a mystical yet real sense, we have a seat at that table. For we too receive the very body and blood of Jesus in the bread and wine here in Franklin, Wisconsin. Okay, now I can't resist showing you one more, one more uh, Renaissance masterpiece okay, before we wrap this up. <laughs> okay, this painting isn't, isn't quite as well known. Okay, it's the painting of the Last Supper, also done in the 1500s Renaissance period by a master named Paolo Veronese. You talk about radical. <laughs> talk about revolutionary. Okay, take a look at that painting. You see all kinds of things going on. Okay, this painting was also done in a monastery. It's in Venice. And once again, the Venetian monks loved this painting of the Lord's Supper. Fact is, this painting got Paolo into a whole lot of trouble with the church, with the church authorities. And let me explain. Again, take a look at, at, at these items in the painting. Okay, Paolo had the extraordinary idea of not only painting the scene of the Lord's Supper, but also painting an assortment of modern people in the front, as if they are at the supper, but they're, they're looking at it. You see all those people kind of um, in, the, in the foreground there. Okay, so there's a assortment of modern people <laughs> as if they're at the Lord's Supper. But Paolo included what, we, what some would call riffraff that are somehow transported back in time and are viewing the original supper as it's going on. Incredible. No one had ever painted a Lord's Supper like this. So Paul was hauled out into a, the church tribunal who paid him, commissioned him to do the painting, and they demanded, they explained the scene. Okay, now take a look here. <laughs> Consider some of the amazing things that Paulo placed in the picture. Now, if you look at a corner on Jesus' right, scrunched down by the rail, you will see a little man in a red suit. Okay, he's way shorter than anyone else, what's sometimes derogatorily called a dwarf. Okay, someone people would have commonly insulted and made fun of. Paolo chooses to put him into the scene with the Lord's Supper going on. If you go further down the rail and around the corner, you'll see a man with a handkerchief who at this moment is actually suffering from a nosebleed. <laughs> Extraordinary. And on the other side of the painting, in front of the supper, are two Protestant soldiers who are receiving both the bread and the wine, as, as we are, Jesus commands us, which was opposed to the practice of the people who commissioned the painting. For us, the painting sends an incredible message. Okay, once again, think about it. The very Son of God, creator of the universe, comes down to be among us, lives that perfect life in our place, suffers the excruciating execution on the cross, And he so chooses to be among us. Frail, sinful, lost, <laughs> at times dejected, depressed, disturbed, nosebleeds and all. <laughs> because of his unfathomable love for us, 
he chooses to join with you in such an intimate, incomprehensible closeness, joining us with his very body and blood to journey right with you. Every step through this broken world. He wants to be that close to you. He wants to be that involved in your life. Never forget the little man in the red suit. <laughs> Never forget the man with the handkerchief and the, and the nosebleed. A couple of scruffy soldiers on the side. Jesus invites each of us to a seat at the Lord's Supper. We'll conclude <laughs> on a note from David's well-known inspired words. With such great confidence and assurance, King David wrote, by inspiration, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, can you guys think David's trying to think of the, the, the scariest image he could conjure up? You're in a situation where you feel as if, as if death itself is coming upon you. David writes, I will fear no evil. Why? David tells us why. For you are with me. Jesus is with you. He is closer to you and more involved in your life than you ever imagined or could even comprehend. With Jesus this close to you, this full of grace and love for you, live your life absolutely fearlessly. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we gather on this, this special night when in your unconditional love you grant us this extraordinary gift of the Lord's Supper. We cherish it like nothing else. Help us to grow in that, in that knowledge, that understanding. You will never leave us. There is not a moment that you are not here with us, understanding what is going on, guiding our lives, always there, right in our lives, closer than we ever thought possible. Give us the courage, give us the confidence to share that life-saving message with friends, neighbors, family, coworkers, those who so desperately still need you in their hearts. In your precious name we pray it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Uh, what a wonderful message. Uh, if you know someone who needs to hear that, I encourage you to go to our YouTube page and pass that on to the people that you care about in your life. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you always recognize this, but usually when we have the Lord's Supper, we speak one of the two creeds. And when we have the Lord's Supper, we usually have the Nicene Creed. And the reason is, is because that's tradition. On uh, the Nicene Creed, we talk about our collective faith. We, we talk in, um, about we, we believe, what we believe as a group of people. Because we're not just communing with God, but we're also communing with one another. We are one with God and one with each other. And so let's speak these words declaring what we believe as a family of believers, connecting us not just with the believers in this room, but really believers throughout history and throughout the world. We'll speak these words together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate to the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for gathering us here uh, to receive your word and also to receive your sacrament. As we're about to receive this meal, we pray, Lord God, that you would take what we heard in the message and you would make it our own, that we would believe that you're meeting with us right here, that you care about us, that even when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. We pray, Lord God, that we see that this ancient event that happened thousands of years ago is now being given to us right now in this moment. And when you give us that understanding and that belief and that faith and that hope, we will give you all the glory. And now we can continue to pray the prayer that you taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our next song. a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where
Great job, Victor Life. Thank you. You may be seated. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, if you're new here, we do have a guest services t- table there. Uh, you can talk to them about your next step here at Victory. And uh, this is, again, the most important week of the year, uh, a time of remembrance, a time of celebration, a time of uh, meeting with God. And so we have worship tonight, and then Good Friday tomorrow night at 6.30. And then uh, for our our Easter service, we do have a Saturday night at 5 p.m., and then our normal 9 and 10.30. So all the Easter services that Saturday and Sunday will be the same service. Um, we rented extra chairs, uh, we, we expect, uh, because we know a lot of you are inviting family and friends and people who are, uh, you know, maybe walked away from the faith, we expect that God is going to do some really wonderful things this weekend. Um, so we're praying for that. Uh, for those of us here in the ministry center, we're going to conclude our service with that meal that, that Pastor Terry Schultz told us about, uh, the Lord's Supper. And I was just thinking about that with, with you know, if, if we could have somebody paint a, a scene right now uh, where, where Jesus is right here in this place, again, uh, bringing that historical uh, event happened 2,000 years ago that's happening right now in the present as Jesus is meeting with us. And so uh, sometimes you, know, you hear a message or you hear uh, and you wonder, I don't know, maybe God doesn't really forgive me or maybe it's not really for me. Well, in the Lord's Supper, he convinces us, hopefully convinces you, take and eat. This is for you. Uh, and so receive that this evening. So in a moment, I'm going to speak the words of institution that Jesus gave us. Um, and then after I do that, I'll invite our assistants to come forward once they're in place. I encourage you to come forward. You can come down these center aisles. There's gluten-free wafers uh, at the tables if that's what you prefer. And then you can um, receive the body of the Lord and then go out to the wings. Uh, there is uh, non-alcoholic wine at the center of the tray. If that's what you prefer, you can rec- then you receive uh, the blood of Christ. And then there's waste paper baskets on, on the way out. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. This time we invite our assistants to come forward once they're in place. Please come forward for the Lord's Supper. Thank you. 
And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith and to life everlasting. Go in peace and joy. All your sins are forgiven. Amen. <laughs>